We're live. I'll, I'll introduce uh, your, I believe your assistant had asked us to do an introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, you should say that I write the gloom, boom and doom report. Yeah. Yeah. And the website is gloomboomdoom.com. Sure. What I'll do is this is after we're done the interview, yeah, uh, sure you do then whatever, I'll just make know. sure that's incorporated yes, yes. onto okay. the thing. I'd rather just start the conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> so please start. Mark, uh, thank you for joining our One Road Research <laughs> podcast. It's, it's amazing to be in your immaculate house today. <laughs> and there's just so many things I'd love to talk to you about. Yes, please. So, Mark, um, it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's a lot. You've been on the news yes. as of late. Um, a lot's been going on, Mark. And yes. um, I, I came all the way here to visit you in Chiang Mai. Yes, and I, I want to nice. I have some views about some of the things that you said as well. And I'd love for us to converse to see sure. what we can do in terms of uh, bringing more clarity to yes, some of your sure. thoughts. Sure. Um, I don't know, perhaps you have like a few lines to discuss about first and I can share to you some of the things that I'm thinking about as far as, I guess, the rise of states, basically, and what, what makes a state become the way that it is. And many people attribute many different components, democracy, rule of law, uh, you know, different origins of heritage. Yeah, sure. So I'd, I'd love to get your take on that. And I know that you, the, the mainstream media has labeled you. Uh, for certain things, but let, let's they talk about that. They label me a racist. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it is. But uh, you understand, even American media company labels me with something, it doesn't mean that it's a fact. As you know, <laughs> the media right. companies during the Vietnam War mm. had a slightly bizarre way of reporting about the events in Vietnam, right. as people know thereafter. And uh, so that is the first point I have to make. The second point is, uh, I studied economics, but I took my PhD about uh, the financial reform mm -hmm. of Robert Peel. It's a historical subject. In 1842, he brought England away from a system of protectionism mm. into a system of free trade. And in order to finance the loss of revenue that was arising from import duties and the navigation laws and so forth, he introduced an income tax. Right. At that time, levied on very few people at precisely 7% per annum. For which country, by the way? For England. Okay. Yes. And this was a very tumultuous time, the 19th century, because as you know, we had all these great inventions and so forth. But uh, as you pointed out, uh, in history, it's always been a, a fascination for me why some civilizations came up mm -hmm. and then decayed. And I've written a book many years ago in the context of the takeover of Hong Kong by the Chinese. It's called The Rise and the Fall of Great Cities. Wow. I go back to like uh, 4,000 years uh, BC mm -hmm. and I describe how these civilizations came up and so forth. So the point I want to make is that at any given time in history, there is a civilization that comes up and challenges the established order. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, that civilization will then decay. And uh, as you know, in the year 3000 BC, <laughs> we Europeans, we lived in caves yeah. and we lived in homes on lakes, on stilts. And I mean, we had nothing, but the Egyptians, they built the pyramids. Right. They built Karnak in uh, Luxor. They built irrigation systems. And they, no civilization in the world was as advanced as the Egyptians relative to the rest of the world in year 3000 BC. Right. The Romans were advanced vis a vis the barbarians or whatever, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the, that advance compared to the Egyptians relative to the rest of the world at that time. 
And then after the Egyptians, we had the Assyrians and we had the Persian civilizations. And each civilization, they brought something to the table. Like the Arabs, they invented our figure system, I right. mean numbers. Uh, we use Arabic numbers. And uh, then we had uh, the Greek civilization and then we had the Romans. And then uh, we had essentially tumultuous times, which was the barbarian invasion and so forth, so that gradually Europe came up. Mm -hmm. And what I was saying at the time is, and I'm not talking here about the value of an individual. Right. In front of God and in front of Buddha, my staff has the same value as you and Mark Faber. Right. Economically, we have a different value. Mm -hmm. Because I can capitalize your earnings and come up to a value for you. Mm -hmm. And you can capitalize my earnings and come up for, with a value. For, it's not a judgment whether you or me are a good person. It's right. a purely economic judgment. And so we enter essentially the 15th century. And uh, we have the discovery voyages by Italians, uh, Portuguese, and the Spaniards. And one of them, Christopher Columbus, he goes, and uh, in those days it was a huge adventure because some people thought the world is flat. flat. And he got of sails there, he will fall off. Some people still think the world is flat. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, we have to admire and you have to see how this Santa Maria, this ship, looked like. They didn't have a refrigerator on the ship. It wasn't the first class cabin. Yeah. Uh, and they had, you had to, to travel for months on the sea without refrigeration is a huge risk because of sickness. Yeah. And uh, all the voyages, Scarred. discovery of voyages, a lot of people always died mm -hmm. of sickness. And anyway, he got into uh, the Gulf of Mexico and he populated some islands and so forth, and then he discovered America. I mean, it was a huge achievement. This really changed the world. And then gradually the Europeans uh, went there, and I have to say, most of the Europeans, I'm not saying everybody, mm -hmm. but most of the Europeans, they went there, they were actually dirt poor. Because that's why they went to America, because they were starving in Europe. When I wrote my thesis about the 19th century economy of Britain, uh, the reason the Irish left and went to America, migrated, is that they, they had potato uh, droughts in Ireland, where the whole crop of potato got destroyed, and so they were starving, so they left for the United States. And these people, and Milton Friedman has also wrote about this, he says, you know, we welcome immigration, but we should have immigration of people who come to the US who want to work, mm -hmm. not of people who come to the US who take advantage of our social security and all the loopholes. Right. So anyway, uh, one of the reasons uh, that America developed so well economically is that uh, in the 15th and 16th century, and then more so in the 17th, 18th, Europe had a very particular system that didn't exist in the rest of the world. What was that? Well, the Italian trading cities of Venice, and Venice for a while, I described this also here, right. was uh, essentially the most prosperous city in the world. It was a city-state, like Florence and Amalfi and Genoa. Because so, of the Medici? Well, the Medicis were in Florence. Okay. Uh, the Venetian were merchants, uh, largely, but they were, say, like Hong Kong, 20 families, they ran the country. Yeah. Uh, it had become a very rich city, but in these Italian trading cities, and 
Brodel, who wrote, wrote about capitalism and civilization, uh, he described that in Europe something very peculiar developed uh, markets, you know, fairs where people would go and exchange goods. And secondly, one of the major achievements on which capitalism could be built was the double entry accounting system mm -hmm. and gradually a legal system. Because the Romans, they had a legal system and a lot of laws were then taken over gradually. So in Europe, we had uh, the Reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, we went from being essentially dominated by the church to a more liberal society in terms of uh, having Protestants. And Max Weber, he wrote the book about uh, the capitalism and uh, pro Protestant ethics. ethics. And this is a very important point to remember that in Europe there is a group of people that came up, by the way the Vietnamese are the same, frugal, mm -hmm. hardworking, reliable and punctual. And on that you can build a society that is economically successful. You understand? This is yeah. a big difference here in Thailand and uh, in Vietnam. In Vietnam, since I have a lot to do with Vietnam, right. people are much more reliable than here, much more. And when they fix something, I've seen this in the house, they come, mm -hmm. they fix, nothing gets dirty. Here they fix something, they just don't care. They leave <laughs> all the dirt there. Yeah, the owner of the house, <laughs> the, yeah. uh, he can clean it up. <laughs> and that is, uh, you know, it's also, and this, I didn't say it, my wife and daughter, when we went a few times to Vietnam, they said, Mark, or well, that daddy, <laughs> is so clean. It's much cleaner than Thailand. Mm -hmm. And this is true, you walk around Vietnam, the cities are very clean, considering the number of people that they are. Right. You go into Vietnamese home, it's very clean. You go into a shop, it's very clean. So these are, you know, uh, each country has its uh, kind of peculiarity. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I said that uh, we should all be grateful that actually the Europeans were the first ones to go to America right. because they brought along these qualities. Maybe at another time it would have been better that the Chinese would have gone there. Mm -hmm. But just to give you an example, last night I was reading uh, about railroads. The railroad uh, was actually the original railroad appeared first in Greece in the 6th century BC. Wow. But of course they didn't have a steam engine, okay. but they used uh, wagons that were on stone. Uh, uh, they had cut the stone so the wagon could be pulled in and out of mines and so forth. Like in the Flintstones. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And we had then also kind of, uh, these were not railroads, but like mining trains in uh, Salzburg right. in Germany. I don't know, sorry, in Austria. But of course they were not on uh, iron and later steel uh, rails. But around 1820, and there were several inventors that each improved on the technology of the previous one. Mm -hmm. They invented the steam engine in Britain and for the first time they ran a train in Britain right. around 1825-1830. Then they built the network and uh, they shipped people between A and B. It took all some time and then when the Bessemer process of producing steel came up at the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, there was uh, a boom in railroadization worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
with the result that in America very quickly uh, there was the first railroad boom around 1857. There was a second one between uh, 1865 and uh, 1873. There was another one towards the end of the century. Most of these railroads went bankrupt, but they had a transportation network which allowed commerce to occur mm -hmm. between city A in the north and city B in the south. And in the meantime, they had also built the canal system and so forth. So we have to see that uh, the inventions that were, A, the scientific advances that were brought about in the 15th, 16th century by Galileo Galilei, mm. by Kepler, by Copernicus, by Isaac Newton and so forth, they were all in Europe. I'm not saying that the white man is better. The Enlightenment. The Chinese, the Chinese, they invented paper. Right. The Arabs, they invented the numbers. And uh, we couldn't have developed uh, the civilization such as we have today with Roman numbers. It's right. very difficult to calculate. So anyway, uh, at that particular time in history, the Europeans were advanced. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying they were not cruel. As you know, we had colonialism in Asia. Yes. But even the colonialism, we have to put in the proper context. Because if I look at, say, India, it would have been physically impossible for Britain that didn't even have half as many uh, people as France for such a small country to control a whole continent such as India. Mm -hmm. Impossible. And the reason I'm saying this is that, uh, as you know, I'm interested in uh, art and so forth, and I visited all these uh, major sites, such as Angkor Wat and the Great Wall in China yeah. and uh, Borobudur. Angkor Wat was not discovered until the end of the 19th century. What it means is that the French were there, but they actually didn't go to the countryside. They stayed in the cities. <coughs> oh, they had some outposts. Uh, and the same in Indonesia, the Dutch. They were in Indonesia, but they probably hardly ever went to Jakarta. Mm -hmm. So colonialism was very much an affair between the ruling classes of these countries that actually welcomed the British to protect their privileges and uh, maintain the status quo. But at least, you know, if you go to Malaysia and you go to Hong Kong and Singapore, the Hong Kong Chinese, they would actually welcome to have a British back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and Singapore. Why has Singapore prospered? Because they have essentially largely, not only, but largely a British legal system. Mm -hmm. And the Brits were maybe not always behaving very properly and as you know in China they uh, blackmail <laughs> they had the opium war and then then I'm not excusing them mm. I'm saying others might have been much worse Mark we um, as you know in in our content at one road we um, also have to study a lot about the rise particularly of Asia because that's like one of our focuses and yes one of the models that we developed is called Asian Capital Development. Yes. And effectively what it means is the development of both the human capital of a country and the natural capital, which is like the natural resources. And um, when I look at a place like Asia, I think about like that point of singularity. So in the case of China, it's literally right after the communist revolution. And then you basically effectively have uh, bank reform and land reform which is basically the state taking over the central assets of a country. And then ultimately what you're able to do as a state is gear, um, for example, credit and source which sectors you ultimately want to develop, yes. such as agriculture, yes. uh, manufacturing, and then ultimately services. Yes. 
So I noticed that um, countries that have gone through, particularly the ones that industrialized the quickest the world over, like in Britain, like in Germany, and like in Japan, um, those countries tend to have a sense of what people would say, they, they perceive themselves as vastly superior. Because when they look at all their neighbors, they're looking at rural uh, focus destination. So for example, Japan's looking at mainland China and saying, hey, you guys are still in <laughs> agriculture. Do you know what I mean? I and I think that um, the whole idea about, I don't think this is really an argument about what, what um, country is better or what skin color is better. It's effectively just very natural. Like, you know, if, if we look at, say, maybe the houses around and we compare that to another house and one is much more immaculate, perhaps you can attribute quality components to the location that is much more immaculate. And what I mean by that is, what if countries that had industrialized a lot sooner then um, thought to themselves that, you know, perhaps we can do good the world over or do bad or exploit the world over, which has effectively led to things like colonialism, right? And that's one of the key premises of the United Kingdom, which was they could spread both the good stuff and the bad stuff as it yes. pertains to them. The Japanese thought that they were entitled to take over pretty much all of Asia because they were much more industrialized. Well, so, we have to be very careful in the context of Japan. Yeah. Because, yeah, they uh, launched the attack on Pearl Harbor. Yeah. We also have to ask ourselves why. I, I think that once Why, you, yeah? yeah, exactly. Once you start, and we also have to ask ourselves, what about the Gulf of Tonkin affair in Vietnam? Yes, yes. that's what you I'm understand. <laughs> the history books are written by the victors, yep, and not by the people who lose. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I don't think it would have come to a war in Vietnam. You mean in uh, in Japan? In Japan, okay. with the U.S. Had the U.S. not uh, enacted a blockade on trade with Southeast Asia, notably on oil supplies to Japan, right? They were actually pushed into the wall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not excusing the Japanese, and we know the atrocities they committed. Yeah. So when people say, "Oh, you, you white man, you committed atrocity," yeah, I agree. We killed the Indians in America. We killed the Indios of Latin America, the Aztecs in Mexico. But a lot of these killings actually occurred accidentally because of sicknesses. Right. You know, the Europeans brought smallpox to the US and mm -hmm. to some tribes in Latin America. They all died out. Even with good intentions, missionaries went to tribes in Latin America. Whole village died out. Right. I mean, it's tragic, but the intention was actually good. It's, it's, I think that's one of the key things about when you look at world history, as it pertains especially to economies, is that once whomever it is, like you said, the victor, um, in this case, it would be like all the current regimes around the world, they effectively, in my mind, become the elites because they're the ones who have the ability to create the currency. They've effectively taken over the most valuable assets of the country, which is the it's potential taxpayer <laughs> and then also all the natural resources. <laughs> so it's, it's just absolutely fascinating to cover this um, subject as it pertains to Asia. Yeah, yeah sure. There's always been in the world a ruling class. Yeah. And Goethe, he said, uh, Nobody is as enslaved as people who think they're completely free. Yeah. You know, there are many ways uh, John Adams, who was one of the founder of the American Constitution, he wrote the two ways to enslave people. Either by the sword, which has been practiced for 5,000 years, mm -hmm. or through debts. Yeah. Credit. Let's talk uh, about credit for a bit as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, just about Asia. Mm -hmm. You see, I came in, to Asia in 73 and I went, of course, I was based in Hong Kong, but I started to travel to Japan and uh, I had to develop business in Japan. But the Japanese, after the oil crisis of 73, 74, 
the large insurance companies, the banks and so forth, they could invest precisely one million dollars outside the country every year. Mm. There are 20 brokers or 30 brokers. You can imagine, you wouldn't have been able to make a business out of it. Mm -hmm. And in those days, very few people invested in Asia. There were some British institutions that had bought Malaysian stocks, Singapore stocks and Hong Kong stocks during the 70-73 boom. Right. And there, you know, an adventure was to buy Sony in Japan or you know, Parasonic or things like this. Right. Uh, so I started to travel around Asia because I thought the big business is to go after rich people. In those days, they were still mostly interested to invest in America. Mm -hmm. They made the money in Asia, in the Philippines, in uh, Malaysia, in especially Indonesia, Singapore, Hong Kong. And then the surplus money they invested in US stocks because they were perceived as performing well and the Asians were not so familiar with Europe. Right and the Asian markets hadn't developed. So I went to Taiwan and I went to South Korea and the Philippines and uh, Thailand and a lot to Indonesia to collect money from well-to-do people. Mm. And it occurred to me that Japan in the 70s was so incredibly advanced, but the society of South Korea and Taiwan they really had a drive, you know. They worked seven days a week. You called someone in Taiwan on a Saturday or a Sunday. They were in 10 minutes at your hotel to right. meet you. And then, then I thought the Japanese market was already then not terribly expensive, quite expensive, whereas South Korea and Taiwan, they had very high dividend yields and selling at you understand? And then uh, the opening came and then the experiment was in the Pearl River Delta with the special economic zones and these special economic zones worked out and so forth. So the experiment by 1990 was uh, then uh, spread over the whole of China. And the rest is history. China has developed incredibly well. And I saw this happening. Actually, my book that I wrote in 2001 is called Tomorrow's Goal, but the subtitle is Asia's Age of Discovery. Mm -hmm. This is the rise, we're in the rising phase of the Asian economic power. Now, some people want to destroy this power, this rise, and so they create problems between different countries when actually the Asians themselves could easily settle everything diplomatically. But some troublemakers come from the outside. Right. And like in the Middle East, some outsiders that just wanted to destabilize the whole Middle East from Afghanistan, Persia, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, and Libya. I think, I think, Oh, one of the causalities of that, because we, we cover that as well, is that wartime economies are very instrumental. It's one of the only good reasons that a state can, um, number one, borrow a lot more money and justify taxes and then obviously issue out more bonds. And remember, as opposed to the key thing, I believe, for every state is that if there is some kind of instability domestically, that puts that current government at risk. Therefore, I think that one of the nice, if I was in power, for example, in America, probably one of the things I would be doing would be to meddle as much as possible. Because if you're meddling internationally, then that means no one's gonna be meddling as much domestically. And I'm, I'm not saying this is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. no. I'm, I'm trying to look at it from a perspective of what one would do and, and now, effectively, China's doing a lot of that now, too, as opposed to just, um, you know, they have to, number one, sustain economic growth. They're now uh, becoming more of an economic hegemon around the region with saber rattling throughout, throughout the South China Sea.
but that also comes with money as well. Their, their, their bank is able to issue out more credits to subsidize the state-owned enterprises that are building the infrastructure. So I think that if, you were, if we were rulers of a state, that perhaps based on the current modern economic system is that it's almost essential. And I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying from a perspective of a pragmatic investor, one can identify opportunities. Yes, I agree with, with everything you said, but to be fair to the Chinese, uh, the Chinese do not have overseas military and Base, naval yeah. bases, and they have one aircraft carrier that probably doesn't even work properly, mm -hmm. but they have very advanced missile systems. Yeah. You know, and electronic systems that they can probably take down every American aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier is nowadays, in today's world, like in the Middle Ages in Europe, a castle. Yeah. The castles survived, except when there was treason, then someone opened a small door, mm -hmm. usually because he had inside or outside a girlfriend. And, uh, but when the cannons came, one castle after the other was destroyable, yeah. one after the other, before they had to build catapults. Uh, that also worked in some cases, but it was not as efficient as the cannon. The cannon just shot down the whole wall. Well, this is all part of, I believe, China's strategy, which yes, is asymmetric warfare. I want warfare. to say this, mm -hmm. you know, we have to see very clearly. When I came to Hong Kong in 73, and ever since I lived in Asia, the saying was, uh, uh, when the U.S. sneezes, Asia catches a cold because 80-90% of exports from Asia went to the U.S., mm -hmm. very little to China. And in 1970, China consumed 2% of global industrial commodities. By 1990, it had already increased to 5% of global industrial commodity uh, consumption. In the year 2000, it was 12%, okay? Mm -hmm. Now it's over 50%. So whether Asia likes it or not, and I understand Vietnam, they have apprehensions uh, towards the Chinese and so forth. I understand all this, but the fact is simply that Asia, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and so forth, they have become China-centric. Yeah. Nowadays, say you take a plane. Tell me how many Americans are in the airplane. In Asia? Well, anywhere. Okay. Well, okay, not in the U.S. domestic. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, of course, they're there. But how many Chinese are here? How many Americans come as tourists to Asia? Five million a year? Ten million? Mm -hmm. In China, they had hardly a visitor traveling around outside China in 1985, they were not allowed. Yeah. Well, the, in the year, Japanese, 2000, the in year, year 2000, there were 10 million Chinese traveling outside the country. This year will be 140 million. Yep. And I can tell you, since I live here in Chiang Mai, if the Chinese don't come to Chiang Mai anymore, the whole hotel industry will collapse. They fill probably 30-40% of hotels here. Yeah. And the big spenders, they don't go to bars and get drunk. But they buy a lot of goods and they go to see temples and so forth. And okay, the Thai say they have bad manners. Mm -hmm. well, the, when the Hong Kong Chinese started to travel outside Hong Kong in the 70s and 80s, went to the Philippines, the Filipinos called them the honkies. Yeah. And, uh, said they have such bad manners and they eat with open mouths and are loud and so forth. They hated them. Now the Hong Kong Chinese hated the Chinese because <laughs> they're like the Hong Kong Chinese 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, let's talk a little bit about um, something we're covering a lot as well and I've heard you discuss a lot about it as well. Let's talk about debt and credit 
And I mean, a lot of growth, when you talk about GDP growth, there clearly is a correlation between debt and credit and what allows for all this growth to happen. Effectively, the state is um, subsidizing this economic growth based on the structure. So it'd be great to maybe cover this a little bit. Well, I mean, this is again uh, a subject that is very complex. Yes. I mean, in the world, we had a relative uh, steady credit as a percent of the economy until 1980. Uh, there were fluctuations and that caused the economic fluctuations or booms and uh, crises of the 19th and 20th century, the variation in credit. But not only, there were also fa other factors involved. But I, after sorry, 19... I think what you mean is after World War II, obviously credit was very high and then it went down again. And then, it went, yeah. was very high because of the war debts. Yes. But there were sinking funds that repaid these debts or in the case of the US, the economy grew very rapidly because during the war there had been forced savings. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this GDP growth, the debt to GDP ratio came down. Also through financial repression, where they kind of closed the economy, they banned a lot of gold trading as well. So they were able to insulate <laughs> the economy while basically inflating assets to some extent. Well, I don't, I don't think they purposely inflated assets at that time. The market in 1942 and then after the war was still much lower than it had been in 1929. But during that period of time, 29 to 46, 47, there had been some huge economic progress. Right. You know, the war economy generated a lot of inventions and so forth that could then apply to, uh, to uh, economic growth. And people had forced savings. They, during the war, uh, there was very little that <laughs> they could actually spend. Yeah. So that unleashed this uh, huge boom, the baby boomers, and a consumption boom and so forth. So stocks actually, the first time stocks after 29 had a lower dividend yield than the bond yield was in 1957. Mm -hmm. Before that, uh, stocks always had a higher dividend yield than bonds. So they were not terribly overpriced. They became overpriced in the late 60s because yeah. we had several pop. And then we had the 70 bear market, the 74 bear market and so forth. And then they became incredibly cheap in 82. Yeah. The Dow bottomed out at 772, below 800. And by that time, it was lower than it had been in 64. And the inflation adjusted for the price increases, it was down 70%. So stocks at that time were very cheap. They were yielding 7 8%. Bonds were very cheap. They were yielding treasury bonds. The 10 years, September 1981, peaked out at 15.84%. And so the 80s then had this uh, adjustment of stock prices on the upside, we became very overbought in 87. But uh, we also piled up at that time, or began to pile up at that time, debts, credit. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a big credit expansion. And uh, this credit expansion, in my view, uh, and every credit, it depends also on what you use the credit for. But basically, um, Credit makes up, like capital markets, as you know, have, are still relatively nascent in many of these countries. And it's actually the central banks in some of these countries that have been driving the growth of a lot of the conglomerates and state-owned enterprises. So when I think about um, the rise of Asia and the fantastic growth rates that it has, it is 
extremely by a byproduct of effective um, state planning. We call it like developmental in our in our newsletter. We call it Asian capital development and how the state develops, the, for example, or subsidizes a lot of the manufacturing sector. And now maybe thinking about um, things within the service space as well. So I, I think the uh, an interesting conundrum is how you can maintain this kind of growth in an environment that doesn't have the credit. And ultimately, from an investment component, um, there's going to be some companies that are going to be able to utilize this capital more effectively <laughs> than others. And when you look at China in this instance, and you look at what's happening in terms of one belt, one road, effectively maybe subsidizing state-owned enterprises to do infrastructure projects domestically um, isn't working as effectively and therefore perhaps they need to do projects that are international so that these companies can still generate the kinds of earnings and growth rates that investors are looking for. So it's um, yes. it's an interesting conundrum. Yeah, yeah, sure, but I just want to say, you know, when we talk about subsidizing industries, uh, yes, there are state-owned companies in China and uh, the state has an influence on the economy and gives direction and so forth. But there are lots of companies in China, maybe they have some government connections, yep. but the private companies and they, they became world leaders. Mm -hmm. Whether you talk about Huawei or you're talking about Alibaba or Tencent and so forth, these are world-class companies. And don't think for a minute that Facebook is just a company that was fo founded by Zuckerberg. Right. They also have connections to the government. That I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, very deep. It, yeah, exactly. Same and, thing. Uh, not, and then I would say in America, this many presidents already a hundred years ago said, including also Eisenhower, that the military complex has an undue influence on American governments. They also said that about the financial sector, about banks. Already in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. they wrote about this. The undue influence of the banking cartel on the government. Right. Yeah, if, if you look at um, Asia. So, you know, if someone tells me Asia is uh, run by governments and the Western world is all free capital, it's just utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. We have very strong government influence. The US government, huh, they spend, the budget is $4 trillion a year. What is the GDP of Vietnam? Maybe one and a half trillion or one? No, um, uh, maybe like 150 billion. No, no, it's more than 150 billion. The GDP of Vietnam. Yes, around. Okay, I don't want to end up in office. But anyway, four trillion dollars that slushes around. No wonder some politicians are so rich. Yeah. No wonder. And there is Milton Friedman, he wrote a book, and I recommend everybody in his speech I gave to read this <coughs> because this is a very meaningful book. It's called capitalism and freedom, okay? Uh, the more government you have, and you know that very well under the communists, how much freedom did people have? <laughs> Do they have more freedom now? Yes. They may not have a lot of power in terms of voting, but you think the simple people in America have a lot of power to influence the politics? They vote for someone, everyone is equally bad equally corrupt. So, the point I want to make is, uh, yeah, we have government influence, but we have a lot of private sector companies, also in Vietnam, mm -hmm. who developed very well. And people say Vietnam is corrupt. Yeah, there's corruption, but there's the corruption in Laos, there's corruption in Cambodia, there's corruption here, there's corruption in Everywhere. Indonesia. The whole world. Correct. Yeah. But at least, the Vietnamese have the good taste not to travel <laughs> around the world and teach people uh, about human rights and about corruption. The Americans, they are as corrupt as others, but they travel around the world and say, you have a corrupt government. 
Well, that's because they're obviously much more developed economically, right? Maybe yeah, <laughs> years and years. I wish they were a bit more developed in the brains. Yes. That I wished. That would be the day <laughs> when Americans become educated. I think you just look at Trump. Yeah. He's, he's not such a... I would have voted for Trump because I think he's the better option than Mrs. Clinton. The Clintons are a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. you know, we know that. But he may never come out to the open because of this and that. And, you know, in Washington, everybody has a file on somebody else. Yeah. So if I whistle on you, mm -hmm. for sure you will whistle on me. <laughs> Mark, we are, this has been an extremely interesting conversation and I know we're running relatively low on time. So there's a few other interesting things I'd love to <laughs> yeah, talk to so you about. We talk about investments now. Yeah, let's, yes, exactly. You read my mind. Um, what, what do you think is interesting based on the world that we are discussing about? And I'd love to share to you some of my ideas as well. Well, one of my theories in the book I wrote, Tomorrow's Gold Asia's Age of Discovery, is that if you look at the investments of great pools of money around the world, these are pension funds, sovereign funds, wealthy people, billionaires, you know, they have money to invest, uh, American institutions, uh, Japanese institutions. Uh, it strikes me that actually relative to the size of the Asian economies. International investors have very little money in Asia mm. or in emerging economies. Then I look at the valuation of stocks and there are many ways to measure a valuation of a stock but in general I would say the difference in the valuation of U.S. stocks relative to emerging market stocks and relative to Asian stocks and relative to European stocks is at the highest ever. And usually there is a convergence. In other words, whatever we may agree or disagree, will markets go up or down, we can state that uh, it is likely that other markets in the next 10 years will outperform the US. It's not guaranteed, but it's likely. The Japanese stock market in 1989 was worth 50% of the global stock market yeah. capitalization. The US is now worth also more than 50%. I understand some of the arguments they use for that. But quite frankly, you work in Vietnam, you're familiar with Vietnam, yeah, there is some foreign money in Vietnam, but basically it's tiny, tiny. Could I want to play devil's advocate in this situation. And obviously, you know, we're, we cover Asia. So uh, studying Asia a lot is that you understand that the stock markets or capital markets play a very small role relative to the economy. Um, people will cite maybe 30% to GDP um, means that there's a lot of upside. But when I think of countries like China and Vietnam, I think that they, as you know, stock market is a tool of, uh, of speculation for some of these countries, as opposed to the primary source of capital raising. And when I think about these communist countries as well, I think about the fact that ownership is obviously one of the most sensitive issues there. If I can't own land, um, then therefore what allows me to own, uh, for example, 100% of a state-owned enterprise? I guess my question is that when people cite again the growth of Asia, is the stock market the mechanism that one can use to capture that growth appropriately? Or is the stock market, which also the government has a big influence on in terms of the composition, because most of the biggest companies at the end of the day um, might directly or indirectly be state-owned enterprises. Correct. So it, it provides a lot of interesting questions. And I think one of the um, interesting destinations that I concluded or sectors that I concluded to be um, the one that will capture all of this growth appropriately 
is also a sector that is not loved at all by the rest of the world, which is probably the banks. And because effectively they're the instrument of entities like the PBOC, the State Bank of Vietnam. In fact, the state's uh, central banks own equity in many of the big commercial banks sure. as well. Sure. So um, despite their potential MPL problems, the history in China is that they're able to constantly replenish <laughs> through bad banks. Well, I, I'd say, you know, the U.S., the economic development started plus minus 1800. Yeah. In 1800, the population of the U.S. was 4 million because the, the Indians had basically died off yeah. through sickness. Wasn't so much in those days through murder, but through sickness. The murder phase came in the 19th century and they carried it out very efficiently. You know how they wiped out the Indians? How? They killed off the population of bisons. The Indians, they needed the bison to eat, mm -hmm. to close the fur, and uh, to build the tents. Once they didn't have the bisons, the Indians were nomades, you know, it was a, a tribal society. They were not you know, living off agriculture the way we had developed agriculture uh, in Vietnam where people had already rice terraces and so forth, that mm -hmm. and they didn't do. And so they, they basically they went into starvation. You know, it's it actually genocide. Mm. Yes. It's like carpet bombing. Right. Laos, Vietnam and uh, Cambodia. You think, you think it's very nice to be carpet bombed? And then they go, of course, around the world and tell all oh, these people use chemicals and how to have good corporate governance and how not to have corruption. And right. then, then, I mean, it's just so funny. But anyway, to get back to your subject, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I think in many countries, the banks will have fluctuations and so forth, mm -hmm. but it's one way to capture some growth. Uh, if I look at Asia, and I mean, of course I'm an economist and I know the background and you can see I have all these collections. Yes, beautiful. These are first editions of economists and uh, this is something that has always captivated me. Mm -hmm. But actually, the most I've learned from observing people. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is, uh, you sit somewhere, I don't carry a mobile phone with me, I observe what people do, mm. uh, how the micro-economy actually functions, and what people will do, say they work, and then uh, they save money, what do they buy? So, they form a family, then one of the top priorities is, say, to buy a small vehicle, a motorcycle, because then they can go with the motorcycle to work, work and come back in the evening. Mm -hmm. This is a major step forward. And the second thing is that people will eventually buy a house, so housing will continue to go up. Uh, every housing market, whether it's been in Europe or the US or in Australia, has had fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes prices come down and collapse, and then other areas come up. Mm -hmm. You know, originally Manila, say as an example, the area that was the most precious area was downtown Manila. Right. All the Chinese were there. But then Makati came up, so the city center moved to the outskirt. Mm -hmm. It's like Detroit. The inner city is worthless. Yeah. But the suburbs have a great value. Same in South Africa. Downtown Johannesburg is worthless, but Stanton has properties that are worth a lot of money. Right. So, if, when you asked me when you came in, I said, what do you think about real estate? I said, depends where and what price you pay. It's the same as in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And it's actually interesting to me how many people manage to lose money on real estate in Vietnam. They yes. just overpaid or borrowed too much money and then then. But 
real estate, in my view, and this is part of my portfolio, I always say you have to be diversified. So you own some stocks, you own some cash and bonds, you own some real estate, and you own some precious metals. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people, the young, they will own bitcoins, but I have reasons to think that it's more desirable to own precious metals like gold. Right. But anyway, so real estate is one place. And as I said, when people get uh, some money, they buy a house. And then what is the second most important? You have two children, you work, you go with your motorcycle to work and you come back. And uh, you have friends, you know, they have accidents and so forth. And some die and then the family experiences hardship. So the third most important is to buy life insurance and health insurance. Mm -hmm. so it's very important for rising society. So the insurance sector does well. And then obviously over time people will eat better and they go to restaurants and then they travel. And so the domestic tourism picks up. And so there are many ways to play it. Right. I agree with you that the capital markets in many Asian countries are not as developed as, say, in the US. Mm -hmm. But let me just point out to you that in Germany, the bulk of companies, and in Switzerland as well, mm -hmm. are private companies. They're not public companies. They own owned by families. Right. Because the family says, well, uh, we have a business, we produce quality products, we have our factory in a village, we employ maybe 500 people, maybe 300 people, maybe a thousand people, uh -huh. we live in the same village. We're also kind of interested to have social peace. And when we walk through the village and go to church on Sunday, not every worker spits at us. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. And I can tell you in Switzerland and in Germany, mm -hmm. the industrialization. And so I think it's actually, if you ask me, look, Mark and Peter, I have this business here. My family owns 80% of the equity. And uh, I have some brothers, we all work in the business. Mm -hmm. We all have children. We all want these children to eventually join the business or at least the ones that are capable and interested and so forth. We want to build this business. Well, in a way, I'm actually quite interested to invest in your company for the simple reason that you have your money on the line. Mm. This is a different story. If you are an employee, your CEO of a company, exactly, the you have no ownership in the company, but you have options, yeah, and uh, you get bonuses. So if you have options, essentially your only interest is to make the stock go up, up. and sell it and walk and say yeah. bye bye. Very short term. Now yes, is a short term thinking. And families, look, in Hong Kong, the major property developers are families. Mm -hmm. You can look it up yourself. What is their leverage? Many property developers, they have borrowings of maximum 20%. Yeah. The rest is family money on the line. The assets are there. And so in 97, when the property crash occurred, property prices in Hong Kong went down 70%, 7-0, mm -hmm. okay? None of the big developers had a financial problem. In America, property prices dropped 30% and half of the country was bankrupt because of leverage. And this brings us back to the discussion about credit. The moment we have two businesses, you, factory and my factory that produce the same goods. We're good friends. Right. Uh, you never borrowed money because uh, from the cash flow you generate on your business, you reinvested in new machinery, new technologies, uh, and you expanded cautiously. 
no credit, okay? Right. But I'm a funny guy. I go drinking every day and I buy five cheers, cheers. Ferraris <laughs> and I play the good life. And right. then I buy a golf course here, borrow from the company, and then I go to the U.S. And buy, you're an employee, too. And then I go to Las Vegas and mm -hmm. gamble a little bit. And it's just borrow from the company. Mm -hmm. Then the rainy days occur. Well, my company has a debt of 100%. Your company has no debts. Which company do you think is more likely to survive? We have to see that. And so I'm uh, a very conservative person. I'm dead against consumer credit. I think people should save. I, when I grew up, none of my relatives in the 50s had a credit card. We went once a month <laughs> to the bank or to the post office, right. got cash, spent that cash during the months, and all my relatives, including myself, when we had income, I mean, working income, salaries, profits, and so forth, we always saved money, always. Nowadays, we have statistics of the Western world. Right. They have no savings. They have, the millennials have less money than their parents, the boomers like me had at age 35, and they have lower earnings, inflation adjusted. Yeah. And that I can say, you know, in Asia, we can argue about whatever it is. But when I look at the Vietnamese and the Chinese and other societies, and also Indians, I think I can, with a high degree of confidence, say that 90 to 95 percent of the people, whether they are rich or poor, but they all advanced in the last 20, 30 years, they all improved their standards of living. Mm -hmm. I can't say that of the Western world. And in Asia, you know, you may say, well, the government owns these companies and that company and so Yeah, to some extent, that's true. Mm -hmm. That number could also be skewed because of the state-owned enterprises. So then if you wanted to include that, then perhaps the number could be bigger, right? It's, it's I think, because I, I, I hear you reference that number a lot, but that there could be some ambiguity with that number. If you include like the state-owned enterprises. And You're 100% yeah. right. <laughs> but let me include in America and in Europe, the unfunded pension fund liabilities. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they don't talk about, but actually, if the government says, uh, in 1994, the U.S. had a government debt of four trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Government debt. Now it's over twenty trillion dollars. Yeah. But if you add the unfunded pension fund liabilities, have all these statistics. In '87, there were no unfunded pension fund liabilities. Now. It's a huge problem that the Western world will have to address. Either the workers, the less and less workers compared to retirees. Mm -hmm. So they have to pay more and more into the pension fund, yeah. which is unlikely possible because they don't have the money. Right. Or uh, the contributions have to be cut. You know, you know the, uh, the benefits have to be cut, so you get a pension of a thousand mm -hmm. and then the pension fund or the government comes to you, the state pension fund, and says, uh, Mr. Peter, we're very sorry, we just don't have money, so we can only pay you 600, mm -hmm. as already happened in many cases. Third possibility is you print money. I think that's <laughs> what yeah. will happen. Or you could basically extend the retirement age, right? Maybe a few more years. Yes, you can do, do that. that. You can stretch the retirement age, but you then have another set of problems mm -hmm. because uh, the, re the elderly people actually, as a percent of the workforce, has increased. They have to work anyway yeah. because they don't. They don't you know, I have friends here, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a place where a lot of people retire. 
So I know reasonably well what people get in terms of pensions. Mm -hmm. When the Swiss go to the immigration office to apply for their yearly retirement visa, the officers always tell them, oh, you're Swiss, oh, you have very big benefits. Mm -hmm. Because they may get uh, $1,800, $2,000 a month in benefits. Mm -hmm. If they have disability insurance, they may get uh, a disability payment of, say, $2,000 a year, uh, a month. And the Europeans, uh, I know Germans, they get maybe 700 euros, much less than the Swiss, much mm. less. And my friend, he has parents, they are Germans, they live in Germany. The two of them together have less than a thousand euros. Wow. You know, they can live, okay, mm -hmm. but I, I can assure you, they don't live well. <laughs> you know, they don't live well. And so, when you tell me, yeah, the debt and so forth in Asia and the influence of the government in the economy is large, that is to some extent true. It's probably larger than is officially stated. Mm -hmm. But in uh, the Western world, it's probably much larger yeah. because of the unfunded pension fund liabilities. Number two, I think in every country, there's an informal economy. You know, mm. It doesn't come really into statistics. Uh, these are small shops. These are hawkers. They have a street <laughs> shop and so forth. And uh, we have a lot of that in Asia. We have a lot of it in Italy. Maybe 20-30% of the Italian economy is the informal economy. Mm -hmm. We have also in America, say, the drug trade yeah. is an informal economy. It then enters the economy through uh, asset purchases mm -hmm. and uh, it enters the economy to some extent through consumption. Right. You know, they go buy also, then they buy also food. But the drug addicts don't buy a lot of food, they buy mostly uh, drugs. <laughs> so, and then I wrote about this because it's very interesting. You know, in America they have this opioid epidemics. Yes. All over the news. Yes, and I wrote already about a year ago about it because it's actually a very interesting subject, macroeconomic. So I'm the doctor, okay? And uh, Mr. Peter comes to my office and says, oh, doctor, doctor, I have this huge pain in my back and this and that. And then I said, oh, I have the ideal pills for you. Mm -hmm. I give you some painkillers that are opioid based. Okay. And uh, then the pain continues, you know, for a long time and you keep on taking these pills and you become a very nice customer of my healthcare system mm -hmm. because you become an addict. Right. And so when uh, whatever that is, you know, you're addicted to these opioid medicines and so forth. And one day your condition of course deteriorates very badly. You can't work anymore. In America, a lot of people, a lot of businesses would like to hire, but the people that want to join, they're either alcoholics or drug addiction. Mm -hmm. You can't use them. Anyway, so the guy is drug addict now. Wow. So he goes to the doctor says, you know, the relatives go and say, you know, our relative here is a nice guy, but he's now addicted to drugs. And so the doctor says, oh, but that's really terrible. We need to send him to a specialist and they will get rid of his addiction new drugs are sold. So the doctor sold the drugs, it goes into GDP, he has more work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the patient is addicted, it sends him to a specialist who again bills him and the healthcare system <laughs> and they send him <coughs> to a psychiatrist and so forth. The psychiatrist is busy and they have a healthcare social worker stopping by the family so that it also keeps them busy 
at the end they send them to a hospital, say in the south, the brokers that can arrange that. Right. He's in a hospital, uh, he has to pay the hospital bills or his insurance will pay the hospital bills, the hospital benefits. <laughs> and so they get involved, it's like in a Kafka book. Right. Once you're prisoner of the system, it will be very difficult for you to get out. Yeah. And that boosts GDP. Mm -hmm. yeah, you understand? That's why GDP is a very ineffective way to measure the economy of a country. What counts is the standard of living, not GDP. Are your standards of living in Vietnam going up or down? My answer is, I think they're going up. Are the standards of living for the average American going down? Yes. Are the standards of living for the 0.1% of Americans and the people in Europe going up? Yes, because the money flows into these people, mm -hmm. but it doesn't flow into the masses. So, so Mark, we are pretty much out of time, but um, I'd love to just uh, finish up this conversation with just a little bit of a talk um, earlier is that you had mentioned that so periodically you get a chance to read some of our content as well and you know what we're trying to do is decode Asia. I'd love to get some of your feedback on some of the things that you've been reading about what we're saying. It would be great to have someone also in the newsletter business to give some thoughts about um, some of our works as well. Well, I think you're providing a very good service, you know, and uh, I think it's uh, good to write more and more about Asia. Uh, I'm a believer in Asia. I don't have much money in the US. I own some treasury bonds, but n not that much. Uh, for the first time in my life, when stocks in Europe became cheap two years ago, uh, I bought stocks. Particularly, I think they're cheap when you compare them to the bond yield in Europe. Mm -hmm. you know, German bond yields, Swiss bond yields, and was the next to zero. So there are many shares in Europe, they have a 5% dividend yield. So as it is, over the next 10 years, you're likely to outperform whereby you know, prices will fluctuate, as we know. Mm -hmm. In Vietnam, the market peaked out in 2006, it's still <laughs> below that level. Yes. <laughs> but some stocks have done very well. Yeah. I was fortunate, I bought one big position. Which one are you? Vietnam to... dairy milk. Ah, Vina milk, yes. Vina milk. And you know, everybody always told me, you sell it and uh, buy something else and this and that. I said, no, I think it's a well-run company. I have no reason to sell it. And uh, for me, it's been a very good investment over time. My Vietnamese portfolio has done very well. Hmm. So, everything is good in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark, uh, for this uh, conversation. I hope that we can uh, continue to have you appear on some of our content as well. Sure. That would be great. Yes, thank you.